Welcome back. Last episode, we discussed the highs and lows of Harvey's first term as governor of Virginia, ending in his being deposed and sent back to England to account for his crimes. This week, we'll discuss what happened in the years between Virginia's rebellion and the outbreak of war in England. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. When John Harvey, Francis Pott, and William Harwood arrived in England, the king understood the severity of what had just happened, and he immediately said that Harvey must be reinstated as governor, even if only for a day, to assert the king's authority over the office. The governor was his representative, not an elected position. He also reinstated Harvey's ally, Richard Kemp, to his position as secretary, something which also helped Lord Baltimore. As soon as the ship carrying Harvey arrived in Plymouth, Harvey took preemptive action against Matthews and his faction by ordering that Matthews and John Pott be arrested. A few months later, he and Harwood both presented their case to the Privy Council. Harwood reiterated the council's reasons for moving him, and Harvey was emphatic that he had been in the right. He said the council shouldn't have the power to thwart his will because it made it impossible for him to do his job. He reminded the king that not only had he been sent to Virginia as the king's representative, but the king had sent him with specific instructions to correct the abuses which had existed under previous governors. He couldn't do that if he was overpowered by the very people that he was supposed to be reigning in. Harvey leveled his own accusations against Matthews, saying that Matthews had wrongfully withheld money from other colonists, but that because he was the richest and most powerful man in the colony, he could successfully evade all legal attempts to resist him. He said that people like Pott and Matthews weren't happy to give up power or to be forced to act in a fair and just manner. The council had fought him when he tried to follow the king's instructions, and they'd been unhappy about the peace that Harvey had made with the Powhatan. He said that none of the accusations against him were appropriate, and that the councillors had pushed him out of office to further their own interests at the expense of the rest of the colony. After hearing both sides, the Privy Council sided with Harvey. The king reinstated him as governor of Virginia, increased his power, and ordered the councillors who had deposed him to be sent to England for trial. Harvey even got a little bit of his back pay. As for Virginia, There's virtually no surviving information about what happened there under John West's governorship. We don't even know whether a general assembly met, so we just can't know exactly how governance changed with Matthews' faction in charge. There is one notable development which was occurring, though, and that had to do with Maryland's tobacco production. Lord Baltimore had been dedicated to the idea of an economically diverse colony, but that simply hadn't happened. By 1637, tobacco was Maryland's official currency and its economic foundation, and that directly impacted Virginia because while Virginia was strictly regulating tobacco, both in terms of quantity and quality, in order to ensure the highest price, Maryland was tiny, new, and selling whatever tobacco it could produce. This would decrease the value of Virginia tobacco, partially by increasing quantity and partially by 
decreasing the reputed quality of Chesapeake tobacco, and furthermore, it damaged the Virginians' ability to negotiate with the merchants, who could now demand the rock-bottom prices for Maryland tobacco before buying anything from Virginia. So that was an emerging problem between the two colonies. And a year and a half after he left, in January of 1637, Harvey returned. The ship which the king sent him back on barely made it across the Atlantic, and Harvey lost most of his possessions over the course of the voyage. He asked the king for reimbursement, but surprise, he was ordered to pay out of his own pocket and told that if the mutinous counselors were convicted in England, he could confiscate an amount equivalent to what he lost from their estates, but until then, he would need to pay his own way. Harvey sent Matthews, Udy, John West, and William Pierce to England as prisoners, and confiscated their property pending trial, and then he went about trying to govern the colony again. He started work on Jamestown's first real state house, and at the king's orders, admitted Maryland Catholic Jerome Hawley to a seat on the council, requiring only an oath of allegiance to the king instead of the standard oath stating the king's supremacy. And colonists went about their lives. People worked on building good quality permanent buildings, and by the next year, nearly every inhabitant had pigs and cattle, as well as an orchard and a garden to grow fruits, vegetables, and herbs like rosemary, marjoram, and thyme. And people were settling farther and farther inland. Harvey allowed court cases to proceed, including those against Matthews, and when cases against Matthews were decided in favor of the plaintiffs, he gave them restitution out of Matthews' estate. And in 1638, Harvey got married. And the really funny thing is that his wife was the widow of council member Richard Stevens, the man whose teeth he'd knocked out. But back in England, West, Matthews, Udy, and Pierce had been agitating against Harvey. The governor couldn't defend himself from across the Atlantic, and Matthews' faction had wealthy and powerful friends among England's merchants. They were acquitted, and the king was starting to doubt Harvey's ability as governor. And of course, this meant no compensation for Harvey's travel losses. Harvey got orders from England to return the mutinous councillor's estates, and he complied immediately, except for the property which he'd given to plaintiffs who had sued Matthews. When Harvey explained the situation, the government ordered that he return all of the property immediately, including the property he'd given away, but Harvey couldn't do that. The property was gone, and Harvey was left with accusations of having willfully misappropriated Matthew's property and disobeyed the king's commands. Harvey still had his handful of supporters. Hawley had died, but Kemp did whatever he could, as did George Dunn, who was in England, and who wrote a 30-page treatise defending Harvey's behavior and accusing the Matthews faction of running the colony's government for their own personal advantage and to the disadvantage of everyone else, including the king. But Dunn's treatise, in addition to being nearly 30 pages long, was filled with obscure literary allusions, rendering it almost impossible to read and totally ineffective in convincing anyone. On the whole, though, Harvey was just done with Virginia. He was done with going into debt to try to help a king who wouldn't pay him govern a colony 
whose leaders showed him absolutely no respect or even basic human decency, and whose populace largely disliked him for one reason or another, some of which were valid, some were invalid, some Harvey's fault, and some things that he had absolutely no control over. So not too long after he returned, one of Pot's friends named Anthony Panton had gotten into a heated argument with Richard Kemp and had called him a jackanape who was poor, proud, and totally unfit for the office of secretary, and who tied his hair with a ribbon as old as Paul's. Kemp was one of Harvey's last remaining friends, and that was deeply insulting. So, right or wrong, Harvey didn't hesitate to convict Panton of mutinous, rebellious, and riotous actions, confiscate his property, and banish him. When Panton returned to England, he joined in the Matthews faction's complaints against Harvey, and by this time it was 1639, and the king was dealing with a rapidly intensifying political situation at home. The old Sands Southampton faction was using the situation to renew their push for the restoration of the London Company's charter, and while the king didn't agree to this, it was the final push he needed to remove Harvey and to reinstate Wyatt as governor. Wyatt had been aligned with their London Company faction and shared many of their ideals, and he was a dedicated royalist and his first term had been largely successful, so he seemed a smart choice to bridge the divides plaguing the colony. In fact, he had been the person who bridged the divide between royal and company leadership in the past. The king also finally officially endorsed the constitutional legitimacy of Virginia's political institutions and appointed George Sands as general agent of the colony in England. And the king issued a new set of instructions for the governor. And one of these changes was that he explicitly authorized the governor to ensure ministers conformed to the Church of England. When Wyatt returned to Virginia, he immediately accused Harvey of abusing his power, seized his estate, and prevented Harvey from returning to England until he could satisfy his creditors. The council actively encouraged his creditors to sue him in the quarter court where the councillors were judges. This had the very pragmatic effect of preventing Harvey from returning to England to give his side of the story and potentially reverse the decision. And it also forced Harvey to sell all of his land and most of his personal property. It took Harvey about a year to do this, and Kemp said that in the intervening time, anyone who had been allied with Harvey was persecuted by the now rampant running Matthews faction. The king had appointed John West master general of the colony, and Wyatt seemed afraid to stand up to Claiborne. Harvey even wrote to England at this time, saying that life in Virginia had become unbearable and begging the Secretary of State to allow him to return to England. And then Wyatt essentially focused on tobacco for the remainder of his term. The General Assembly passed an act saying that because the quantity of tobacco had driven the price down, the colony would burn half of the good tobacco in addition to the bad, so that the whole quantity wouldn't exceed 1.5 million pounds. And they also fixed the price of tobacco. In addition to this, though, Wyatt also sent documents and petitions to England, helping George Sands advocate for a restoration of the London Company. In 1640, Wyatt sent these documents to Parliament and secured the passage of a resolution authorizing the revival of the London Company. The king wasn't prepared to get into another fight over the Virginia Company 
well over a decade after it had been dissolved, and just as he was getting pulled into a fight with Parliament. In fact, avoiding such a fight was why he had sent Wyatt in the first place. So if Wyatt was going to make the situation worse, he would replace him as governor, and in his place, the king commissioned the man who would become the most famous and longest-lasting of Virginia's early governors, a man named William Berkeley. Harvey made it to England around the time that Berkeley was named governor, and when he arrived, he found people like Anthony Panton continuing to criticize his term, this time using the criticisms to try to discredit the king's commission of Berkeley as governor. This agitation actually led to a year-long delay in Berkeley's departure, during which Richard Kemp and Christopher Wormley, who was another of Harvey's allies, were also detained in England. Berkeley, Kemp, and Wormley all submitted counter-petitions to the House of Lords, asserting that there was no basis to Panton's accusations, but that even if the stories about Harvey were true, they wouldn't make it necessary to delay their return to the colony. Berkeley arrived in Jamestown in March of 1642. He was from a distinguished family, a graduate of Oxford who nonetheless had a decent agricultural background. He was a playwright and a courtier who was so admired that people wondered why he would choose to waste his talents in Virginia, of all places. In hindsight, those talents weren't wasted at all. Berkeley had Harvey's values and Harvey's priorities, but with the refinement, political acumen, and people skills which Harvey lacked. Berkeley arrived in Jamestown in March of 1642. He was from a distinguished family, a graduate of Oxford who nonetheless had a decent agricultural background. He was a playwright and a courtier who was so admired that people wondered why he would choose to waste his talents in Virginia. In hindsight, those talents weren't wasted at all. Berkeley had Harvey's values and Harvey's priorities, but with the refinement, political acumen, and people skills that Harvey lacked, as well as a little bit more power to do his own thing. Before presiding over his first General Assembly session, Berkeley encouraged the body to split into a bicameral legislature with the Burgesses in one house and the council in the other. This enabled the Burgesses to act as a counterweight to Matthews and his council faction, and it allowed Berkeley to forge a direct alliance with the Burgesses. This circumvented the need to work directly with the council, and it allowed him to take the position of being the people's ally. So suddenly the political dynamic changed. Berkeley could now convince the Burgesses of his position and turn to the Matthews faction and go, and of course you agree, right? Of course, the Matthews faction couldn't disagree because disagreeing with the colony's legislature would destroy their credibility. So their power was instantly deflated. And Berkeley had done what no one else could. The Matthews faction was still there, but Berkeley neither fought them like Harvey did, nor submitted to them like Wyatt. He just put them in a weaker position and made it impossible for them to strongly oppose him. And that allowed him to do things like confirm the colonists' right to trade with the Dutch. And Berkeley led the Burgesses in council in a harsh denunciation of the attempt to reconstitute the Virginia Company. They drafted a document saying that the return of company rule would destroy all the democratic rights allowed by the king's instructions, 
rights such as legal trial by jury and the right to petition and yearly assemblies, and saying that it would impeach the freedom of trade which was the blood and life of the commonwealth. This was another example of Berkeley's political skill, because first, the Matthews faction wouldn't have done that voluntarily, so this shows just how instantly Berkeley exerted his influence. But more importantly, the document was simultaneously a declaration in favor of the king and a demonstration of Berkeley's allegiance to the colony's interests. It both showed the king that Berkeley was in charge and that Virginia would work for his interests, and also showed the colony that Berkeley, as the king's representative, was the best safeguard to the colony's interests. It stated both the colony's support of the idea of self-government and its firm aversion to rebellion against the king. All of Virginia's ideals listed in one document led by Berkeley. And so suddenly Berkeley was the person at the head of creating the ideal shared by both the king and the colonists, and threatened by the company. And if colonists didn't follow the carrot of an idealistic vision, there was a stick to bring them into line. Any colonist who promoted the idea of the recreation of the Virginia Company would be tried, and if found guilty, considered an enemy of the colony, and as punishment have his entire estate confiscated. And finally, Berkeley recommended the Assembly repeal various legislation which paid even a small amount of money to the person in the position of governor. Whether or not Harvey had actually done anything financially untoward, this immediately made Berkeley popular. The Assembly immediately declared that the new governor preferred the public freedom to his particular profit. So Berkeley's governorship may have started at a tenuous time in history, but he was a force to be reckoned with. As for Harvey, he never got his money. He fought for the king during the English Civil War, but in 1645 his wife died and the king lost, so Harvey wrote a will detailing what money he was owed, which was well over 7,000 pounds in total, and how that money should be divided among his children if they could ever get it, as well as bequeathing 400 pounds to the poor of his London parish. After writing the will, he departed for some unknown destination, and that's the last record of his existence. It's quite possible that he never returned to England. His will was dealt with in a way that was usually reserved for people who died at sea, so it seems that with his wife dead and the war lost, the old captain decided to sail off into the sunset, never to be heard from again. Or something like that. And on that note, we've taken Virginia to the point that we've taken New England and Maryland. Through the tumultuous years which predated the bloodiest war in English history, and you can see the wide range of stances that the colonists will take during the war. But before we get into how the English Civil War shaped America, I want to flip the tables and look at how American colonization encouraged the outbreak of war. And that involves the story of Providence Island, England's second most important failed colony. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.